Hello World Health Organization, we are a group of passionate data analytics students. It has been 248 days since WHO declared COVID-19 outbreak a pandemic. COVID-19 has definitely impacted our lives tremendously. WHO have been actively collecting data about COVID-19 situation and we are interested to analyse the data to get some insights of the situation. Let us bring you through our analytics journey. Firstly, we will be demonstrating and running our codes. Then, we will be comparing SQL and MongoDB and finally giving our recommendations to WHO. Before we start working on the queries, we edited the dataset by dropping irrelevant columns. For SQL, we used three CSV files and for MongoDB, we used four collections. One of the collections for MongoDB named Mask Mandatory Countries was a table derived from SQL question 8. Here is the entity relationship diagram we have crafted out based on the data we are using. We have four main entities, continent countries, case test, response and percentage change from baseline. For the relationship between continent country and case test, for one country, there can be zero or more data for case test. Country would have many data for case test as there is one data every day. Country would have no data if they did not do any tests for COVID. Locations and date would uniquely identify each row since one location would have one or no data for case and test for each day. For the relationship between continent, country and response. For one country, there can be zero or many data for response. For one country, uh, one country would have many data for response as they could have many different types of measures implemented as a response for COVID. Country would, not have, would have no data if they did not have any response for COVID. Country, response measure and date would uniquely identify each row since one location can have a different start date for the same measure implemented. For the relationship between continent country and percentage change from baseline, for one country, there can be zero or more data for percentage change from baseline. Country would have many data for percentage change from baseline as there are different data for the different sub regions for the country. Country would have no data if they do, did not have any percentage change from baseline. Country, respond me response measure and date would uniquely identify each row since one location can have a different start date for the measure implemented, for the same measure implemented. For question one, we selected distinct location from the continent country table and filter out rows based on continents, which are Asia. This is for SQL and this is for MongoDB. Moving on to question two, we selected distinct location from the continent country table and filter out rows based on continent, which are Asia or Europe, and total cases, which are more than 10, and also date, which is 1st April 2020. This is for SQL and this is for MongoDB. For question 3, we selected distinct location from continent country table and filter out rows based on continent, which are Africa, and date between 1st April 2020 and 20th April 2020, and also total cases less than 10,000. This is for SQL and this is for MongoDB. For question 4, it requires us to filter out the countries that completely has no data on total tests, meaning that for all the dates belonging to the same country, there are no data on total tests. We have checked that there are no rows with value 0 in the total test column, hence if all the rows have no data, the sum of total tests by location will be 0. This is for SQL and this is for MongoDB. For question 5, we display the sum of the number of new cases when grouped by year, then month. We did not include the rows without data for the continent. This is for SQL and this is for MongoDB. For question 6, it is the same approach as question 5, except that we have to display the sum of the new cases when grouped by continent, year, and month. This is for SQL and this is for MongoDB. For question 7, we have different approach for MySQL and MongoDB. For MySQL, 
we need to get information from two tables by linking them to get linking them together with the primary and foreign key, which are country and location. We set the condition to have only continent equals to Europe, and response measure must contain mask. For MongoDB, we created a collection with all the required columns, all the required information together, hence no need to use lookup. Then we set the condition to have only continent equals to Europe, and response measure must contain mask. Thank you, Han Xiao. Now, moving on to question 8. So for question 8, we are required to compute the period in which most EU countries has implemented the mass mandatory as the response measure. So to start off, we first need to create a temporary table that contains the distinct countries in Europe that has implemented the mass mandatory response measure. Additionally, we need to change the date ends, that is NA, to 1st of August 2020. Afterwards, we need to expand the dates according to the country's start dates and end dates. To get this result, we need to use a cursor to look through the temporary table to expand the dates for each country's row by row. The query result will then be stored in mass mandatory countries table that contains two columns, namely the expanded date columns and the column indexes that represents the countries. Finally, we can count the number of countries that implements the measure per day by grouping the data by date. Then we can use the having clause to get the dates that has the most number of countries implementing the measure. This is the result for the SQL query. For the no SQL query, we exported the mass mandatory countries table. Then we store the maximum countries that implemented mass mandatory measure in a day in a variable called max. Next, we use the aggregate function to group the data by dates, and then we count the number of countries that implement mass mandatory measure per day. After that, we filter the results in which the number of countries equals to the max variable. This is the result for the NoSQL query. Next, question nine. We are required to conduct trend analysis for Europe and North America for each day during the period and compute the number of new cases. So we first need to filter the data according to the continent and date ranges. The continent needs to be Europe or North America, and the date needs to be between the minimum date from the question 8 result and the maximum date from the question 8 result. Then. We can group the data by continent and date to get the sum of new cases in all the countries in each continent per day, which is named total new cases. This is the query result in SQL. For no SQL, we can use the same query structure using the aggregate function. So we first filter the data using the match function, group the data by continent and date, and finally project the date continent, and sum of new cases. This is the query result in NoSQL. Moving on to question 10. In this question, we were required to generate a list of unique locations that have successfully flattened the curve, meaning that it achieved more than 14 days of zero new cases after recording 50 cases. Before we went into the script, during our data exploration, we identified several missing dates in OIT COVID data. However, after we did a quick check on this, we can safely assume that the missing dates will not affect our result when we put zero case in the missing rows. After we confirm our assumption, we then solve this question by iterating through the rows. At first, we set three empty variables namely test, log, and count. Our function will then iterate through the rows for the same location. If the new cases is zero, then it adds one to the count and put it in a newly created column called consecutive rows. However, if the new cases in some day is not zero anymore, it will reset the count back to zero. This way, we will be able to track every time there are consecutive rows with zero new case. Not to forget, we also created a where clause of total cases must be more than equal to 50 to assure that they have experienced COVID before. After we generated the result, we filtered it again by adding a where clause to show countries that have consecutive rows more than 14. Now, we can see a list of countries that have successfully flattened the curve. 
Using the same approach, we apply, uh, we apply it into our NoSQL database by aggregating our previously modified OIT COVID data that already has the loop result in it. To do this, we can just use match to only show the countries that have total cases more than equal to 50 and consecutive zero cases that is greater than 14. Then, we group this by location and display the maximum days to maintain consistency of result with our SQL. Moving on to number 11, this is actually an extension from previous question. Whereas in this question, we were required to find a list of countries that are experiencing second wave, means that they have successfully flattened the curve before, but experience an uptick in new cases with the requirement of at least 50 cases during a seven days window period. To do this in SQL, we use the same query with what we used in question 10 to get the list of countries that have flattened the curve. And after that, we find the date where they experience their first uptick in case after they flattened the curve. And with that date, uh, we generate a seven days window period and store it into a table. From this table, we can just easily use the having clause to filter out those upticks countries that doesn't have more than 50 cases within the seven days window period. And then we can generate the list of countries that experience the second wave. Similarly, we do the same for the NoSQL. Using the previously modified OIT COVID data JSON file, we aggregate it by only showing countries that have consecutive cases, uh, consecutive zero cases greater than 14, total cases greater than equal to 50, and total new cases during the seven days window period greater than 50. Then, not to forget, we also group it by location. Now, we can see as well the list of countries that experience second wave in NoSQL. In number 12, we are asked to display the top three countries in terms of changes from baseline in each of the place categories. To achieve this result, we write one query each for every category to find the top three country. In our SQL, for every country, we group the data by country, then we average the absolute value of the country level changes from the baseline. Then, we use the WHERE statement to exclude the sub-region data to make sure that the records that we are averaging are only the country level record. Finally, the result will be ordered based on the percentage change. Then we select the top three country using limit. Then we write the similar query for every of the category to find each category's top three. Here is the result. For the NoSQL, we write the query in a similar way, just on a different syntax. So we use the match to replace the where statement, then we also use group the, to group the data by country, then we calculate the average value. Here is the result. So moving on to the final number, number 13. Here, we are asked to conduct a mobility trend analysis in Indonesia to show the daily changes in mobility trend for the three places categories after it had reached 20,000 total cases. To show this, we first make a subquery to generate a list of dates after Indonesia had reached 20,000 total cases using the OVID COVID dataset. Then on this list of dates, we display the country level changes from baseline and the three categories required. Here is the result. Now for the NoSQL, we also make a query to generate a list of dates, then we store it in a variable. After that, we make another query to display all the country-level baseline changes in Indonesia within the list of dates in the variable that we had made. Here is the result. Now that we have ex explained all our queries, I'll move on to explain our non-relational database design and compare it to the relational database. Our non-relational database is composed of four collections, which include the three original data set and another collection that we add to help in our analysis. We also restructure some of the JSON file in the collection to help our analysis. As compared to a relational database, our non-relational database is not designed to follow a certain database schema. Therefore, we can restructure the non-relational database more flexibly. So, in the final implementation of our non-relational database, we design it in a way that is best to help in our analysis. Now, 
I'd like my colleague Angel to deliver our final recommendation. Generally, a relational database works by linking information from multiple tables through the use of keys, such as primary and foreign keys. The connection between primary and foreign keys then creates the relationship between records contained across multiple tables. For non-relational database, there are no tables, rows, primary keys, or foreign keys. Instead, the non-relational database uses a storage model optimized for the specific requirements of the type of data being stored. In terms of syntax, SQL is easier as compared to MongoDB as the code required to get the output is lesser and simpler. MongoDB is also case sensitive unlike SQL. As seen from the comparison above, SQL is more readable and less error prone. The dataset sits comfortably in rows and columns as there is no nested information. There are also few attributes related to each entity, hence it is easily displayed in a table format. The size of the data is moderate, therefore a relational database is suitable. However, considering that the COVID situation is constantly changing and more data may be generated, if there is new information added that needs to be stored in a nested format, MongoDB is better for unorganized data, which is hard to be displayed in a table. For example, for the column response measure, information such as effectiveness and details about the measure can be nested. Overall, the best way to answer the current queries would still be using SQL. But as data size and complexity increase, WHO can consider switching to MongoDB. In terms of efficiency, MongoDB opens the subset of the entire file to display the index of interest, and it is more efficient than SQL, as SQL needs to load the entire database to pick up the row or column. To answer the current queries, the current data size is moderate, and the time difference taken to load and execute the dataset and query is negligible. There is no significant time difference between MongoDB and SQL as both takes a few seconds to run. In this case, both databases are satisfactory with MongoDB being the slightly better option in terms of runtime. Furthermore, in terms of scalability, SQL can do both vertical and horizontal scaling, while MongoDB is best for horizontal scaling. However, it is hard to scale horizontally for SQL as large datasets can cause problems as the master needs to duplicate data to slaves. This also results in a higher cost. To answer the query, scaling is not needed as data size is moderate. However, in the future when data size and complexity increase, WHO can consider switching to MongoDB. Lastly, MongoDB is able to handle real-time data unlike SQL. However, COVID data is typically reported and updated only once a day, and there is no need to handle real-time data. In conclusion, we would recommend WHO to use SQL to answer the queries, as the data fits well in tables, and it's also easier to implement queries since it is a lot more readable than MongoDB. Thank you for your attention, and we hope you enjoy our presentation! And please,